Are y'all ready? I think we need a light on back there if you don't mind. Shall we pray? Lord, we humbly come before you. And we declare how great you are. And how far you have drawn us to yourself, Lord. And all we thank you. For you're the rescue of our lives. You're the rescue of our souls and the transformer. The one who brings us joy. And the one who offers peace. The one who is continually abiding with us. Oh, how we need your help right now. We need you to hover over us with your spirit. And come into us afresh and new, Holy Spirit. That we could receive from our master. And open our eyes and ears to receive his word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 The hour is short. I'll give you your choice. The word or chase the rabbit. Chase the rabbit. Chase the rabbit raise your hands. Chase the rabbit. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The message. Now one hand, please. One hand. One hand. Ch Mama's saying chase the rabbit. <laughs> she don't even know what chase the rabbit is. <laughs> <laughs> all right put your hand down mama. all right chase the rabbit raise your hand one hand only one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve all right message one two three four five six well we are chasing the rabbit why don't you teach for 20 minutes then chase the rabbit <laughs> All right, I have a request to speak for 20 minutes. You can do that. I'll take the challenge. It'll be practice for the church. That's right. Give us the first sermon for the church. Well, my clock is not cooperating. There we go. We are going to head off into the Word for 20 minutes exactly. Romans 3 and 23 is going to be the context of the subject for the next 19 minutes and 48 seconds. <laughs> For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This passage of scripture, most of us hang our head because it implies that we're short. It implies that we've fallen short. But before we've ever done anything, before we've ever sinned, before we ever did something that was darkened to our soul, our nature was already fallen. He's not necessarily giving an account of when we slid off the wagon or when our cheese fell off the bread or when we got our jelly and peanut butter mixed up. He's giving an account of the state of our souls, that we're in need of something. I think the glory of God is something we need to look at because it has something to do with his nature. I love it in the J.B. Phillips translation. It says, God's righteousness... And I don't have that. I wrote, I put the wrong thing in there. Isn't that something? Let me call that up for you. See if I still have it up. Because it was significant. There it is. But we are now seeing the righteousness of God declared quite apart from the law. Though amply tested to testified to both the law and the prophets is testifying about God's righteousness for us. It is the righteousness that he imparts to us. It is a righteousness that can and will operate in all of those who have an abiding faith and trust and relationship in Jesus Christ. There's no distinction to be made anywhere. Everyone has sinned. Everyone falls short of the beauty of God's plan. That verse 23, where it says in the King James that all have fallen short of the glory, 
also translates all have fallen short of the beauty of God's plans. God has great plans for us and we don't understand the plans that he has for us. We don't understand that that he can articulate down to the finest detail of everything that there is that we need in life. The concept that we get of God, I I can remember when I was uh, young, uh, my mom and myself and my brother and dad and we had been living in Southern California. Times were pretty lean, to say the least. And I remember my mom finding some pants on sale at one of the stores. I don't remember what store it was. It was there in California. And my brother and I looked at him and said, oh, thank you, Mama. <laughs> 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 they were jeans. And they only cost, I think, 35 cents a pair. And it's probably because the store couldn't sell them. But they were real jeans that we could get down and play in and that would last us for the summer. Now, when a regular pair of jeans was selling probably for 3 or $4, these were on sale for $0.35. Cents. Now, they were bell bottoms. We didn't care for that too much. And they had orange paisley prints all over them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And we stood out quite well in, in all crowds, even in California at that time. <laughs> My brother and I quickly forgot how silly we looked and went on about our business of just being young boys of probably fifth, no, seventh grade, something like that. But I can remember traveling from there after my parents kind of got their feet under them, some gas money and a car fixed. Traveled from Southern California back to Texas. My dad liked to travel back and forth from California to Texas because he could find work in the wintertime or in the summertime in California. At that time, he was a cleaner and presser by trade, and when all the weather got 90 to 100 degrees there in Texas, all the dry cleaning plants basically just closed their doors because nobody's wearing suits. You know, who can wear a suit in 100 degree weather, you know? And so he would go to California and we would spend the summers out there and he would have pressing and cleaning jobs that he could get real quick out there. And then he would want to go back to Texas because family was there. So anyway, we returned to Texas and my father had a father that considered himself somewhat of a Pentecostal holiness preacher. He wanted us to go to church with him and my grandmother. One thing I could tell you about my grandfather, even though he considered himself a Pentecostal holiness preacher, he was the hard-heartedest man I've ever met in my life. My grandmother, she was the selfishest woman I've ever met. I went to church with them, and I loved God. I loved him with all my heart. And I remember my mom only had maybe two dresses to her name, and those were sleeveless because we were in Southern California where it's warm all the time. Not provocative by any means, just sleeveless. And we walked into that church. Our hearts were nimble towards God and wanted to really love on Him. But I can remember the uncomfortableness of being surrounded by people with their hair in a bun and long dresses and... Oh, you evil sinners. Oh, we've got to get you to the altar. And I remember them laying hands on me and dragging me to the altar and the embarrassing moments. And, and it, was, it, was, it was hard. It was hard. It was my first experience in so-called world of Pentecostalism. And I can tell you, it was not filled with the grace and love of the Lord that I knew. It was my first experience with someone who said that holiness was there, but yet they were entrenched in denominationalism. They were entrenched in their, their, their idle gossip behind the scenes of how someone dresses and how wicked someone might be. And, and I could remember them, oh, we won some people to the God, and, and, and we're, he's going to change and transform their lives. And I could tell you my mother had more love in her heart than all the people in the entire room. There was more purity in my brother and my mother and myself than there was in the whole room. Not to escalate us to any high onslaught with God, but to give you a taste of what it's like to run into superficial holiness on the exterior 
God is interested in the beauty of what's inside. And as a result, it made me one who, I, I don't know if I want spiritual things or not. Because I've I seen those people that are supposed to be spiritual. They were hard. All they could care about was religious terms and, and some sort of experience of the moment. The softness and the grace of my Lord that I had known for years, it was not there. And it put within me a, a real fear of going on in the spirit because of the inaccuracy of other people thinking they had something when what they had was a superficial holiness on the outside. I didn't find the beauty of the radiance of my Lord there. I didn't find the beauty of the radiance of my Lord in the midst of what they were doing. They had it so coined and so canned that you know I do believe in holiness. But holiness is us being like God and us set apart for Him and in Him. It is not a, just a set of rules. It is a lifestyle that enters our heart and mind based upon the peace and the love relationship that we have with the dynamic living God that is in our presence. They knew maybe of some spiritual giftings and prophecy and things like that. But oh, there was such an absence of the love of God. I had been raised around Christians who were filled with the love of God although there was an absence of spirituality. And I could tell you that I far, far would rather be in the absence of spirituality than I would in the absence of love. I think our brother Paul coins it right. He said, even though you can speak with the angels, of the tongues of angels, even though you can, you can prophesy, even though you can, you can move mountains, even if you don't have love, you are just a loud, loud gong show. Uh, I'm paraphrasing that for you. Remember the gong show? <laughs> Get them off the stage. Now, it, 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 it gave me a setback in my spiritual growth because of the uh, obvious uh, interlude with something that was not truly holy. What was it lacking in holiness? It was lacking the beauty of our living God. I have some scripture for you because I, I love the way he says everyone has fallen short of the beauty of God. I love that phrase being coined that away because when we read it in the in the King James it seems rather rough handed. It makes God kinda like a bully, you know. I, I was raised as just God being a God of love. And when I started running into some of the Pentecostal holy movement, although there was a zeal for God, I also felt that they were presenting God as a bully. And God's not a bully. God is a gentleman. He, he is a God of, of love. And yes, there's the austere part of God that we do need to face. But he first of all wants us to fall in love with him and see his beauty. Because we cannot serve a God who is a bully. We can serve a God who is gracious and kind and loving and gentle and draws us to him. And yes, if we're his child, he may have to correct us. But if you've had children, was your whole relationship with him one of correction every day on every subject, on everything? No, your relationship was one of them as family and love and fun times and, and growth together and interaction and relationship and fellowship. So our relationship with our God is supposed to be exactly like that. And yes, there will be some correction that's involved in there, but I, I bet you that that is, uh, what, one one-thousandth of a relationship when you had kids that you had to actually deal with correction? I mean, it's, a, it's obtuse to me as an adult to have to deal with my child to correct them. I don't mind doing it for their benefit, but it's an interruption of my peace. Anybody who has children, they have to interrupt their peace to, in order to correct the children. And the children don't, don't realize that. Now, those children that are obedient get much more love, much more attention because they don't have to go through the withdrawal. See, the parent doesn't necessarily go through the withdrawals. The child does. No, oh, you corrected me. I'm going to stand back. I, I, I'm, not, I'm going to get out of the way. I'm not going to have anything to do with you. And that's still us being that little sarcastic baby that, that can't handle. Don't do that. Or can't handle... Can't you stay in step? All the rest of the kids are, can't you stay in step? But 
in wanting to take that offense, then the hard, austere part of God begins to appear to them in their eyes because they're also not seeking God on a loving, basic relationship in the simplicity of Christ and the love of Christ that Jesus has to offer us and wants to impart to us. I want to, I want to read you the, the rest of this in, out of the Phillips translation. Uh, Everyone falls short of the beauty of God's plan. Under this divine system, a man who has true faith and obedience is now freely acquainted in the eyes, acquitted in the eyes of God by God's generous dealing in his redemptive act and processes through Jesus Christ and by Jesus Christ. God has appointed him as a means of this perpetuation or negotiation of a special contract between me and him. He's appointed him as the means of this, a perpetuation accomplished by the shedding of his blood to be received and made in effect in ourselves if we will only trust, obey, and listen to and have faith in our great Lord Jesus. God has done this to demonstrate his righteousness both by the wiping out of our sins of the past the time when he withheld his hand you understand he, he's withheld his hand in not punishing us for that sin. He, he withheld it. Jesus takes it on himself and by showing in this present time that he is a just God who cares about you and wants to justify you if you will believe obediently his son, Jesus Christ. I love those simple terms. I know it's not these and nows, but it gets it down into our English. But everyone falls short of the beauty of God's plan. Do you realize that there is beauty in his plan for your life? The, the, the scripture talks about God being this God of righteousness for us, that this plan that he has will fulfill us. That, that beauty and doxa, which is glory, kind of interchange and weave throughout the Old Testament. Matter of fact, there's five different sections in the Old Testament where God is making the statement that we are to worship him in the beauty of his holiness. So I, I, I want to take you to some passages of scripture in the Psalms and ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship him in the beauty of his holiness. Now, what that actually says in the Hebrew it says, worship him in holy array. And what that's talking about is when God came down to earth and he said, okay, I, I want to show you how to build a tabernacle. I want to show you how to intricately weave cloth together like my angels do in heaven. It was of cunning work. It was something that was visited upon men on a heavenly stature, this tabernacle and the ornateness of it on the inside. The threads of the tapestry were finely woven and interwoven. There was multiple layers of these curtains that were like shears hanging. That when the lights were on on the inside, that there was gold that was back behind. There was a space and then there was this beautiful curtain with interwoven lace with cherubims on it, with gold spun in it, scarlet spun in it, blue spun in it. It was absolutely beautiful in its decorations. But guess what? When the priest went in there, to actually worship the Lord. And the police went in there where the lights were and where the bread was and everything was right and God was going to come behind the curtain. It's no doubt the most beautiful thing that's ever been constructed on earth. I say that because it's a reflection of our living God. And when the priest put on his holy garments, every thread that was interweaved in those tapestries that were hanging the same colorations were interweaved in the robe that he had on. 
And as he went in, these different colorations, he blended in. He formed the beauty that was in there was now beauty that was upon him. And so when the Lord begins to speak to us, he's talking about the divine order that he has made. It is beautiful. It is absolutely articulated and it is symmetrical in its design. When God began to design the earth, the earth was absolutely symmetrical in everything. It was perfect. It was without void. It was without, it, it had the form and the handprint and the breath of God on absolutely everything that there is. I want to give you a definition because I've got some notes that I can give you that is here in uh, doxa and in the beauty of God. The glory of God means his unchanging essence in the beauty of his holiness. It means the ordered splendor of him and the symmetry of his perfect character seen in all things in its original design. It means his nature, his likeness, Giving glory to God is ascribing to Him His full recognition in absolutely everything that there is. The true glory of man, on the other hand, is the ideal condition in which God created man. See, we don't have glory, but Adam did. And the glory that he had was the likeness of God that was breathed into him. That likeness of God that was breathed into him was the character and the nature and the beauty of God itself imparted to him. I love 14th century dictionaries, and I love dictionaries that are even older than that. Although it's difficult to somewhat understand the English that was in there or, or however it was written. Out of 14th century dictionary, beauty is referred to and even gives scripture reference in one of these dictionaries, the little pocket dictionaries I have down here. There's a scripture reference down there. And beauty is, God is the personification of beauty. In other words, a definition. He's the originator of the nature and the purpose and what it looks like and what its character is. God is the personification of all beauty and glory. And thus, beauty is the extension or attribute of him and his image. You remember, we were made in his likeness and in his image. The beauty of him, the beauty is the order that he made and the express likeness of him in his creation which reflects his glory. Beauty is a quality or aggregate of the qualities of God in a person or thing that gives pleasure to the spiritual senses or pleasurably exalts the mind or human spirit into being a beholder or partaker of that which is expressly ordered and divinely made, that which is possessing his divine qualities, his loveliness. A beautiful person or thing as someone who is made in the image of Christ. Someone who is particularly graceful and ornamental in spiritual ornaments and is excellent in quality like the nature of God itself, is brilliant in its light and is an egregious example. I looked up that word egregious. It's like gregarious, which means distinguished. It also has a definition of a quantum characteristic. You know what quantum is? That's where they get the, the definition of quantum mechanics, and it goes way back, the word. Does. It means the smallest particulates that there are. Well, it would be the smallest mechanics that there are. It means the quantum characteristics of God himself that accounts for the existence of everything in this life and the life after, including the heavenlies. The Epsilon particle. It's a particle of his characteristics deposited within us, that nature of him that brings his beauty. So when it says worship him in the beauty of, its hol of his holiness, it is us coming close enough to him that we can feel his love, that we can see and interact with the tapestries of his presence. We can see, I was made like this. I, I wasn't made to be evil. I wasn't made to partake of evil. I was made to be like this. When you see what you were made to be like and see the beauty of God and the splendor of his beauty, all of a sudden this objectivity of wanting 
to be like him becomes a passion within us where we chase him like the wind in deep passion to know him and the beauty of his holiness. Amen. <laughs> Pardon? Uh, no, no. That's it. Now we play Chase the Rabbit. Yes, Gary. So do you want to practice where we pass, uh, pass the plate for donut for tithing and everything? <laughs> <laughs> I, I left my gun upstairs. <laughs> All right, let's play Chase the Rabbit for a few minutes, and we'll call it quits for the night. I know tomorrow's going to be an early day. And uh, how did the Lord speak to you, first of all, on the message? Did you get anything out of that? Did you hear anything? We'll do that first. Okay, let's chase the rabbit then. No questions? You're dismissed. <laughs> I'm expecting responses up here. You're going too quick. You know, I never thought about the beauty of holiness like that. I never... I realize that when he made us, he made us in his image and likeness, but I've never thought about the beauty that he put in us in the beginning until you read that scripture and began to expound on it. It didn't occur to me that we, we've lost so much. We've lost so much. Yes, but we can gain so much back as we become a part of Christ. Tristan, would you turn the AC unit back on? Yes, Gail. I, I also like the, the visual of we fall short of the beauty of, of the Lord. And um, I, I don't really, I'm not going to expound on that, but I just, I just love that visual. I, I love the visual. It's the beauty of his plan. Yeah, that's There's what I was going to say. an actual plan that he has established for your life yeah. that is beautiful. You know, that's what really touched me too. And, and that's what the enemy always is trying to take out. You know, and so when we see his beauty, like that song says, all else fades away. I mean, people would drop sin like a hot potato. And and we're, he he puts his image in us, you know. Anyway, yeah. that was really good, Curtis. Yeah. Now, I can tell you one reason we forget about his beautiness, beautifulness, and, and, and the warmth of that interior place with him. It's when he says, would you not do that? And then we don't respond, well, yes, my Lord, I, I won't do that. Then I still get to go in the holy place. But if I pout and walk off, now I've, you're hard. Oh, you're hard. It's, no, I'm the one that's hard. I don't want to receive his instruction. Therefore, I don't get to go in where the beauty's at. I think he's keeping me out. He's not. It's my stubborn pride that's keeping me out. He just wants me to say, yes, Lord, and go on with him, which is real simple. Anyone else? I liked the um, your description of the curtain not being just one like a tapestry that is all one piece but in layers with the gold in the back and then, then the you know and as they move and as the spirit moves through the holy place um, I can just visualize in the light that is the Lord, because that's the only light in the in the Holy of Holies. Um, it must be really something to see. And we are completely covered in the midst of that. The only king can be seen is Jesus wrapped around us in the robes of righteousness. Right. And I, I also agree with everything else that was being said about um, the beauty of God and and the beauty of his plan, I, I find myself so often thanking or praising the Lord for his, his plan because it is so perfect. Even though I can't comprehend it, I know it is, you know. And, um, and that when we're conformed to his image, we'll be um, conform to his plan as well and everything will be in harmony like you s it talk will. about and it will yeah it was uh, very very good thought thank it you it is isn't it so simple that 
just our one word of resistance can keep us from seeing his beauty. One word of resistance. If he just gives us a simple instruction and we don't want to see it, we don't want to follow it, we don't want to do it, we're the ones that soul up like an old possum. We're the ones that reject it and now we can't see his beauty. And he becomes hard and austere to us, it seems, because we can't see his, see his beauty. Our disobedience is like a, a giant wall that comes between us and seeing the beauty that, of him. If we can see his beauty, then we'll begin to see reflected from him in us beauty that we don't have inside of us. Yes, Mary Lee? Was the beauty of the plan that uh, touched me too because it kind of went with your word that you gave earlier, well, the Lord's word. I, during worship, um, I felt really, really comforted, really safe uh, in terms of not having to figure out all the lies ourselves, but that the truth and the beauty of God is what crucifies the lies in us. And so that's the beauty of the plan, and the plan includes us being in our place as in the one-man army. So to me, that's beautiful. To me, it's beautiful. I mean, that's a place of security and safety for me that there, there's a plan that could be described as beautiful yeah. and that we don't have to or I don't have to spend so much time trying to fix myself, but instead finding the beauty of the plan. That's it. That's it. <laughs> it's like, you know, I, Jackie and I went to the, the uh, North Carolina up in the Smoky Mountains, and it was right during the peak time of colors changing. <clears throat> and there was just layer after layer and canopy after canopy of different colors. God ordered that and structured that and the beauty that was there it was mesmerizing it's like the light became a part of you and it was different colors as you were climbing up the mountain that we climbed that beauty that was there is the same beauty that's reflected in him everything on earth is his creation everything was originally designed to reflect a part of his beauty and the greatest diadem that there is to reflect his glory is you so it is something when we take on his nature and his likeness like we were originally made. Because all we do is see more of him and go deeper in. And it is, it's glorious to know him. Anyone else? The thing that really caught my attention was the verses before um, that verse about... Um, us falling short of his glory, his beauty, um, it said he is our righteousness. Yes. And that's the answer. We've fallen short, but he has become that in us. And I just praise God for that. You know, I, I love that particular passage of Scripture because within it is also coined the part that it's available to us. This was written to his church, people who were already doing this. I can tell you that there's many who are captured in sin and are not obedient to Jesus that think they have his righteousness. Well, I'm just believing God that I'm A-OK, -okay, I'm still going to the bars. And I can tell you his righteousness is not resident within them. He doesn't take his body somewhere that's a rat hole and deal with rats. If they repent of that, then righteousness based upon their action. See, God made a, a plan. That perpetuation is a plan and a covenant with Jesus that we're going to obey him and do what he says. If we do what he says, then his righteousness can be imputed to us. But it is a fallacy for anyone in this entire universe to think Jesus' blood was for nothing and can freely spend it where they want, when they want. So, I agree with you that it is his righteousness. But that righteousness comes when I, Lord, I believe in you. I believe you're here. I'm going to be your disciple. I'm going to sit at your feet. I will obey you. Now, in that, I'm stating, I trust you. 
that you have all this other stuff covered. Now, when I trip and fall, I'm trusting you that you're going to sc scoop me up because I know I'm going to make some mistakes. But, you know, there's a big difference in being a pig and loving the pig pen and us being a sheep and falling in the pig pen. A sheep that falls in the pig pen just has mud on their coat and they want out. Even if they wallow in it for a while, they're still sheep and they'll want out eventually. A pig never wants out. So Jesus looks at us and he says, are, are you going to follow me? See, that, that righteous act that he did, the father said, okay, here's the deal. I'm putting my son right here on the line. Now here is what he's like and will, will you obey him? Will you accept his leadership? Will you accept his counsel? Will you? Because see, that's part of the agreement that we're supposed to come into. So God will say, I accept him in exchange for you. Now, I will let his righteousness come over you. So there's some false doctrine going on that is, goes in the excusatology realm of allowing people to continue to end their sin. That God says that, that, that the Spirit was not given to us so that we could have an occasion to the flesh. Instead, the Spirit was given to us that we might become obedient to Jesus. And the more we're obedient to Him, the more we bask in His presence. Now, I had difficulty when I first came to Jesus and, and first received the Spirit. I was half in the world and half out of the world, you know? I was in the oil field, I was a young man, I was tempted with all the temptations, I really didn't have a, a good leg under me about not dealing with some of those things, although I wanted, didn't want to disappoint my mom, I, I wanted to do things right, I still had a great failure rate, but it, with my failure rate, each time I failed, it was not something, I'd, oh Lord, I don't want to do it, oh Lord, help, I, and then I'd get locked on something, and I'd end up in some sin situation, and afterwards I'd be on my face on the ground crying, oh God, what have I done to my soul? Oh God, I need your help. Now that's a sheep that it keeps falling in the pen. And Jesus has atoning righteousness for our mistakes like that. He has because it was not, I am going to go do this. You get away from me, God, so I can go do this. Or I'm not going to listen to you. That was not in my soul. Instead, it was one, oh, rescue me, oh Lord, from my wrong desires. And so in that plan of his rescue, he one by one unlocks the dungeon doors, one by one dismisses the demonic forces and rebukes them, and at the same time he's strengthening me to walk on my spiritual legs to become stronger and like him so that his righteousness now comes over us. So I probably need to do a teaching, and it would probably be a five-part teaching on just righteousness alone and how we get into right relationship with Jesus to acquire the full allotment of his righteousness. Do you re realize if you acquire the full allotment of his righteousness, what changes there would be in your life? If the Lord, if Father looks down and he sees all the righteousness of his Son upon you, there is not anything your Father in heaven would not do for his Son, Jesus Christ. So this garment of righteousness is something maybe we need to take a look at in the future and I need to do some teachings on of how we wear it, how we put it on. Because it's like I'm in this room and, and, I, and I have one, you remember those old fly things that you used to whoosh, shoot flies with the insecticide? I mean, it was DDT and you're whoosh, and the cloud's blowing back in your face, you know, and the fly drops, oh, look, I got him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I look at Jesus' righteousness, him coming into our presence, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit releases one of those clouds of Jesus' presence. Now, the people that are closest to are going to get hit with some of it. The people in the next row is going to be hit with a little bit less. The people in the next row, everybody may have been exposed to one or two molecules, but isn't there more of his righteousness that can be acquired if we'll just come close and stand right in front of the nozzle? And it hits us squarely between the eyes where it belongs. <laughs> so there's much more of his righteousness that can be poured out in us and upon us. And oh, what it can do for us is amazing. Any other comments, questions? I was, I, I liked everything that everybody said. I agreed with that. But one thing I really liked was when you articulated the... Um, the veil and the, the curtain and the, they're different ones and how that the colors all uh, intermingle and then going behind as the priest went behind and how he intermingled in with all of that. 
that I that was just overwhelming to me because it then it made me realize how the intermingling of of myself in the Holy Spirit and in him and it, it's it's hard to get that grasping uh, at times but that was a great visual of showing how it intermingled because of the different colors the way it was structured and made and the way the garment on the priest was made to intermingle with it that was that was good thank you praise God all right last question that was it huh <laughs> well, let's, let's bow our hearts before the Lord. Lord, I ask you to hide your word in our hearts. And help us keep in mind what a great God you are. And how beautiful you are in the order of your plan that you have for us. How beautiful it is, Lord. How gracious it is. I'll just wash over our souls with the thought of it, Lord. So we can see you in the beauty of your holiness. That we might have hope that indeed your son is capable of changing and transforming and extending his robe over us. Like Ruth and Boaz. We ask you to cover us with your garment of righteousness, Lord Jesus. We'll sit at your feet. Be your bride. Let us behold the splendor of you and the beauty to the romance of our relationship. We'll always be in the forefront of our lives. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Well, y'all got your first 20-minute message. <laughs> Be careful what you ask for. If y'all could help put up the fort, that would be good. Yeah, 7 o'clock at the church if you'd like to join the paint party. Uh, we Actually, if you could arrive at 7 because we're real short on time. It wouldn't hurt if some people arrived a few minutes early because we need to stage everything and get the scaffolding out and get all the paint out and paint brushes out and ready for some of the other people. We need ladders out and staged and I think we're missing a couple of ladders. If somebody's taking ladders home, we, we might need those tomorrow, especially those great big ones. And uh, anyway, uh, God bless you. If you could put up the fort, that would be good. Seven o'clock. I just voted for Chasing Rabbit so you could go to bed. <laughs> <laughs>